Goedemorgen Bram. Good morning. Oké, okay, so we have uh, the possibility to try out your uh, presentation. All right. Um, where is? So I can share. It, try to share the screen. Yeah. Did you see anything or? Not yet. Oh. Just wait a sec. Yeah, if you can put it in presentation mode. Fantastic. Do you have any comments for Bram? Oh, he didn't, he was not part of the dry run, so you can tell him. Okay, and then I start sharing. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Okay. Good. So we're waiting for Joost. Uh, it was going to join at 10 o'clock, and then we can start. Okay, Tova Yelid. Hey, Manishma. Banana Gosin, the Seda Gamu. Yoshi, Tavli Ototrayo, Girototach. אהלן חן, מה העניינים? אלי זכות. אוי אמור חן אלי מעל, איך ספרקן בית הנדרלנד, אז איך בן איך טרוץ? נדרלנד זה ספרקן, איבדי. אוקיי, אני פניתי שיר. אני רק... My, 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 uh, I, I spoke pretty good Dutch in 1994, uh, and I, my dream is uh, when I retired, I yeah, speak better Dutch. So it's one of my uh, missions for later, later stage in life. <laughs> okay, that's great. So I suggest that we'll start. Nell, can we start? Great. Okay. Goedemorgen, Bokel Tov, good morning. I'm very pleased to host the um, Dutch-Israeli Innovation um, Mini Symposium on AI and Radiology. Uh, my name is Racheli Kreisberg. I serve as Innovation Attaché at the Netherlands Embassy in Israel, and I work for the Dutch Ministry of Economy and Climate Change. So far, uh, due to Corona, we have conducted 10 mini symposia in different subjects, including health, but also in other domains such as energy, um, high tech. And we've had two pitching events in which um, Dutch startups pitch for venture capital uh, and hope to raise some funding from Israeli and Dutch venture capitalists. In addition to that, we had one summer school on hydrogen, and um, this was really uh, one of the highlights of our activity this summer. But we're very pleased to continue working on the AI and health domain. So far, we had already three mini symposia in this domain. One took place in March uh, on AI and health. The other one uh, was a mini symposium in which we presented healthcare solutions for home care by whole center and Israeli uh, representatives that took place in August. And um, in December, we had a mini symposia on AI and dementia, which was led from the Dutch side by the organization JAME. So this is our fourth mini symposia on AI. And this time we focus on AI and radiology. Um, it is part of our mission at the embassy to develop R&D collaborations between Israel and the Netherlands. And one of our means is uh, to share knowledge with uh, Israeli and Dutch um, participants from uh, all sectors. That means from the private sector, from the public sector, and from academia. 
Um, one of my major objectives is that, of course, something concrete will come out of our activities, and this could be in the form of an EU project. And therefore, at the end of our program today, we also have a presentation of the national contact points in Israel and in the Netherlands on the three calls that we think could be applicable for the people that specialize in AI and radiology. So without further ado, I would like to um, open our program. Our um, program will be opened by my colleague, Dr. Gen Segiv. Gen is the co-founder and the co-CEO of Segiv Tech a computer vision and AI project company, as well as the co-founder and co-CEO of Deep Pathology, a company that aims to disrupt pathology with AI. Ren is also the co-founder of the largest computer vision and AI event in Israel, IMVC, the Israel Machine Vision Conference. And she is also a board member of the Israeli Dutch Innovation Center, which we established at the embassy. Ren, please uh, start your uh, introduction. So uh, Racheli, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words. I, I, uh, I think that uh, being a board member at the IDIC is really uh, super exciting for me because uh, it uh, involves two of my great loves, uh, one for uh, AI and the second one is for the Netherlands as I spent there three fantastic years uh, in my 20s. So uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank you. I think we have a fantastic uh, program today um, and, and this is uh, great to see uh, uh, such uh, speakers from both uh, Israel and the Netherlands. I think that um, uh, AI is revolutionizing uh, healthcare and I think that radiology is really a pioneer in this revolution because uh, it uh, started the digital revolution quite early and then I think uh, it, it's amazing to see what is happening in the last I don't know, a, a decade a, a, or even five years, uh, how, how things are really going from research to a day to day uh, practice. And I think that the people in this uh, forum are, are making a huge impact uh, in this uh, area. I think that uh, what we would like to see coming out is, first of all, to, to provide information to those people who are in the field of radiology and hear from the leaders in this field. I think also uh, people who are in uh, doing AI in other domains, such as pathology, surgery, uh, tabular uh, data, etc., can really learn a lot from the experience uh, of uh, uh, the, the presenters here, and, um, and and we can take it to other domains and, and learn a lot. Uh, 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 from this uh, session. And last but not least, also uh, from a personal point of view, I have uh, two bridges that I really love in Holland. One is the Macher Bruche in Amsterdam, which I really love the story of it. The, I will tell it in a different time. And, and the other one is a bridge which connects between Hochmade and Waubruche. And uh, so, so and, and I think that also this occasion is about making a bridge between Israel and, and, uh, and the Netherlands. And uh, I hope that good things will come out of it. So uh, I wish that we have a fantastic uh, session today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ren. And um, our session will be opened by Dr. Efrat Sheffel, who is the president of Philips Israel. As the president of Philips Israel, Efrat plays an important role in the transition of Philips to a customer-centric digital solutions company. Previously, Efrat was the general manager of Philips Imaging Clinical Application Business Unit, and prior to that, she led the oncology informatics venture at Philips, focusing on informatics and decision support solutions for oncologists. I will also mention that we were very pleased to celebrate together with uh, Philips 20 years of innovation of Philips in Israel last November. Efrat, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angeli, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think this is a very important topic, so I'm very glad to uh, contribute uh, my part to, uh, to this. Okay, so um, diagnostics and AI, I say diagnostics because uh, I want to say just a few words on pathology as well as, uh, as, uh, as we continue. Um, but maybe because I'm the first speaker, I want to start with just a few minutes of a higher view of AI in healthcare and why we need it and where it can help before deep diving or going into the radiology. So um, why do we even need AI in healthcare? So uh, I think that uh, healthcare providers and systems are under increasing pressure. Uh, 
We see an aging population and due to many advances in the heart and good work by is a different physician and researchers around the world, diseases that used to kill us a few decades ago very quickly are now manageable over a many, many years. So a one in three adults worldwide is under chronic manageable, manageable diseases continuously. And the result is an increasing pressure on the health systems and the health professionals. Uh, almost half of the health professions professionals report feeling burnt out. And worldwide, we are missing around 18 million professionals. So anything that can help uh, reduce the work burden uh, and, and unnecessary or less professional activities uh, from the health professionals it would be very helpful. And I think AI can potentially play a very, very important role here. And then there is, of course, a, the economical aspects of things. And we see the increased expense and spends on healthcare. Uh, they are very high today. We project that in the next 20 years, they will double. And it's not sustainable. So again, AI can help uh, reduce costs in many, many places. And we uh, just to, to say one word about medical data. So we understand there is explosion of data in all domains and also in medical. Medical is actually driving a big part of it. A, a lot of it in medical page, uh, imaging, patient monitoring. Uh, it supports uh, the move of healthcare uh, into the home. So home monitoring, pathology, genomics, et cetera. So all of this very, very important. And when we talk about AI in healthcare, there are actually three places uh, where we see that uh, it could really, really support. One is augmenting the expertise of healthcare providers. This is where radiology and AI goes in, and that's where I'm going to focus the rest of my talk. But just to mention, we, we can, and we already uh, see a lot of companies and a lot of activity around improving operational efficiency. Uh, we can predict the uh, flow of patients and the resources needed. We can do a uh, predictive maintenance uh, and other many, many other things. And empowering people to take better care of their health and well-being. This has to do with monitoring people, uh, Internet of Things, etc., and and really being able to give a personal recommendation to people based on their own a medical record and the and the current situations and those two worlds are huge huge worlds a, of domains of knowledge a, so we won't touch them and we'll talk about radiology so this is not a technical talk i'm just trying to uh, you know give the feeling of where ai in radiology is and where ai in healthcare is in general so this is actually a, a view from 2018 of all the companies in Israel that work on AI. Um, and first of all, it grew since then. Okay, and this is AI in healthcare in general. And Israel, you know, is a very, uh, you know, a active domain in AI and in healthcare. But of course, uh, you can multiply it by many, many, many times if you want to see the global view of this. So you can see it's there and it's very active. And you can see here is the medical imaging on the left corner top where a radiology goes in and some of pathology as well, genomics right next to it. And on the right corner, diagnostics. So uh, even just this uh, subdomain is already uh, very, very active uh, with companies. And uh, the message here is it's active and it's really not in the universities. It's real, it's here. It's working and uh, we are just at the beginning. We're just at the beginning of a very long journey. And, and I'll give you examples of four different companies, Israeli companies that are working on this and they already have solutions. Uh, just to, to give you a taste of, of the kind of things that uh, already exist. And I'll start with Nanox AI. And I know there is a talk about Nanox AI in a few minutes or by the R&D leader of Nanox AI. So I won't say a lot here, but I think it's important to, to note uh, that there is a whole suite of solutions. Uh, the solutions are uh, always a combination of a medical question or a medical domain uh, with a, a, an imaging modality, okay? And they are all technically there and they are all regulatory cleared, okay? So the first hurdle was, can we do it? Technology-wise, we can do it. The second big hurdle was the regulatory. 
can we get it uh, cleared? So the answer is yes. This company and many other companies already have clearances. And I think Nanox AI uh, just uh, broke one of the, of the glass ceilings by getting the first CPT code. Uh, I believe for compressed uh, fractures in osteoporosis uh, diagnosis by AI. So this is moving forward and the rest of it probably will be in, in the next or one of the next talks. So that's one example. Uh, then there is this company, ADOC. Um, ADOC is another company that is working in AI and radiology. And like the previous ones, they have a whole suite of solutions, 10 or more, most of them uh, with regulatory clearance already. They are deployed in many medical centers. Um, and it's also interesting to see that both those companies attract the interest of investors. So uh, it's always good to feel how the investors look at the domain because they have a very sensitive seismograph of where they think the potential is. And the fact that they are investing uh, quite significantly in this domain is also an indication that they believe this is going to grow and very significantly. Uh, DIA is the next one. It's in ultrasound. Um, and I think uh, it's a good example where uh, the AI supports both acquisition and interpretation or detection uh, of the images. Again, there is a, a regulatory okay. approvals, it's automated, it's commercially available, it's deployed in, in, in thousands of users, etc. I, I think uh, um, it's interesting to note that uh, DIA to a large extent is integrating its solutions into uh, the platforms of, the, of let's say, uh, the manufacturers of uh, ultrasound. And by the way, I did not mention the previous companies also have very strong integration into the reading environment of the radiologists, et cetera. We'll talk a little bit more later about the integration into the workflow. But all those companies you can see are already there. Um, and all of them are in the process of developing more and more of those applications for their suites. And last but not least, I wanted to talk about pathology just for a couple of minutes. So pathology is following radiology at a very quick rate. So what took radiology close to 20 years to move from film to digitization and then to AI? And that was the whole process. Uh, pathology is kind of doing it squid in the timeline. So digital pathology is getting now into the hospitals being deployed uh, by many, many health providers. And right, uh, right after that comes the AI, and there are lots and lots of companies worldwide that are working on AI for pathology. Once it's digital, you can get quite a lot of information from the images. And IBEX, again, is an Israeli example. There are other Israeli examples. And uh, they already have C clearance. Uh, they, they received a FDA breakthrough uh, status. I think they are waiting for the FDA approval and they're already deployed, working, et cetera. So that gives you an idea of where we are. We are on one hand side, a, a way ahead of the start, right? This is not theory, this is happening. And on the other hand, you can see that, you know, even if we combine all of the solutions and all of the applications of all the companies, we are solving, generally speaking, a small part of the radiologist needs as of today. Uh, there's always a question about what will the radiologist do? What would happen with the radiologist if and when, uh, you know, AI becomes a day-to-day -day practice, etc. And a few years ago, there were a lot of concerns about that. I think those concerns are, you know, the radiologists are a little bit going away today because as AI uh, progresses, it's also becoming very clear that it's not here to replace uh, the radiologist at all potentially modify their work and spend more of the time on the more complicated uh, scenarios and less on the day-to-day -day, uh, basic, let's say, readings. But even the most basic uh, readings, you know, you can see the same thing on the image and without understanding the clinical context of the patient and the diagnosis and would be very, very different. Uh, so I, I think that it's very, very clear to everyone uh, that we really need to combine AI with the clinical knowledge uh, and it will probably have an impact on the day-to-day -day work of radiologists just like digitization had, but uh, they are not going away. Actually, I think are going to grow in, in importance because of this. 
so sorry so if it's all that good and it is actually that good so why isn't it really the day-to-day -day practice of every radiologist in the world just like i don't know like the informatic systems the taxis etc so we see actually uh, four main uh, domains or or uh, blockers uh, or areas where we need to invest in order to be able to scale AI uh, in healthcare in general, but very, very true for radiology, as Chen mentioned before, is at the forefront of, the, of healthcare and AI. And the four are people and experience, data and technology, governance and trust, and partnerships and new business models, and I'll talk shortly about each of those. So people and experience, there, there are two big things there. First of all, it's really we need to concentrate uh, on the unmet needs of both healthcare providers and the patients. And I talked about the seamless workflow integration before. I think that radiologists do not have time to stop the work or their normal workflow. They're doing it on the tax, on the reading station, move to another uh, place, look at what the AI tells them and go back. So I think it's obvious to everyone in the field that things need to be integrated into the day-to-day -day workflow. And uh, by the way, all three companies that I mentioned are doing that, are integrated very, very well into the workflow integration, many other companies as well. Uh, and that's really, really important. And the other is uh, to develop and train AI-ready workforce, both uh, when it comes to the knowledge and understanding of the uh, strengths and limitations of the technology, uh, just like any other technology, and also uh, with some level of trust that is developed over years. Are those algorithms, you know, black boxes? Do we trust what they're saying, etc.? And those are very, very important. Then there is data and technology, and we understand that what we really need to develop in AI in radiology is high quality, properly curated data. And unfortunately, most of healthcare data today is locked away uh, and it's in disconnected systems and it's not necessarily of high quality. Uh, so that's a huge barrier to the development of AI in radiology. Uh, so everything that has to do with data sharing, interoperability, standards uh, of how you enter data into your system, et cetera, is very, very uh, critical for the success and the development of AI. And, and, we, and we look into the future, and there are lots of talks about the next generation AI, where you actually have federated learning, where different institutes and hospitals and even countries you know, send their data into the cloud, and then you get a huge data lake, and everyone can use it, et cetera. And I think that's a, that's a dream. That's where we want to go. We are very far away from that. Governance and trust, uh, this really has to do with how the public looks uh, at AI in general, also how, how the medical professionals uh, look at it. So uh, here we talk about things like ethics, like fairness, like transparency, privacy, security. Uh, this is a world uh, which grows hand to hand in hand uh, with the growth of the technological capabilities. And we, we know that if we train our data, uh, train our algorithms on a, a data that is not a representative of all population, then it will be biased. And if we don't include a, a both genders in the data, it will be gender biased. If we don't include data of all races, it will be racially biased, et cetera. So all of those things are very, very important. Uh, for the growth, and uh, and there is a beginning, I think, of some significant work on that. And last but not least is partnership and new business models. I think it's very, very clear that we need to climb the reimbursement and funding hurdle, uh, and, I, and we heard just good news a couple of weeks ago, but also that this is a world uh, that we will only manage to conquer by partnerships, uh, both partnerships of the uh, people and companies that develop the algorithms with those that uh, are uh, doing the acquisition and reading so that there is an integration of the workflow. Uh, but also each company, you know, is taking a piece of a much bigger uh, puzzle that we need to build. And uh, we really need all of those together. So you see the growth and emergence of marketplaces, quite a few of those 
where you can put bring algorithms from many different companies kind of a of a marketplace where the radiologist can choose what he wants what is best to that's it uh, for my talk and thank you very much thank you very much a lot for your talk and uh, I would like to move on to our next speaker um, Naama Mayel who serves as an AI team manager at wiz.ai where she leads the development of several FDA-approved AI algorithms in the neuroradiology domain. Nama has more than 10 years of experience in R&D managerial positions in the medical device and digital health industries, focusing on computer vision, NLP, and computational geometry technologies. And Nama will, uh, is uh, our next speaker, so please feel uh, free to start talking about accelerated care coordinated powered by AI. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, so first I would like to take this opportunity and thank you Rachel and the team for inviting me to speak in this mini symposium on AI and radiology. It's, it's a great honor for me, truly, thank you. Um, today I'm gonna talk about how we at this accelerate care coordination using AI and give you a glimpse into our fascinating world. I'll start with a brief introduction. My name is Naama Mayer and I lead a large team of AI researchers developing state-of-the-art al algorithms for detection, classification, and segmentation of neurovascular pathologies. Let me share my screen. Good. You see my screen? Great. Okay. So what's on our agenda for today? So, I'll use stroke as our main example of care coordination acceleration. I'll explain what is stroke and how we at Visalai accelerate care coordination. Uh, then we'll have some deeper dive into our AI algorithm. And I leave some time for questions at the end. Okay, so what is stroke? A stroke is a medical condition in which poor blood flow to the brain causes cell death. There are two types of stroke, ischemic stroke due to lack of blood flow and hemorrhagic due to bleeding. Both causes parts of the brain to stop functioning properly. In the image here, you can see a clot in a certain part of the vessel that is causing ischemic stroke. So what's, what's the magic treatment in this case? I'll just review it in a nutshell, of course. So a thin tube is inserted into the artery till the brain. Through this tube, we insert a, another device that is aimed to catch the clot and pull it out. Okay, so let's review some facts about stroke. Stroke is the fourth killer in the Western world and the number one in healthcare expenses. Every minute of delay of treatment equals around 2 million dead neurons. You can see here the graph, this graph on the right, we call it, it this time is brain because it demonstrates well the time criticality of stroke treatment and how bad is the functional outcome when we treat the stroke too late. Having said that, only 10% of patients get appropriate and timely treatment. Our goal at VIZ is to actually provide all patients with appropriate and timely treatment. So what's the problem that we at VIZ try to solve? Let's review the workflow in the hospital prior to using AI for care coordination. The process starts when the patients walk through the door and getting a CT scan. You can see that the process is composed of a lot of different steps and progress depends on the availability of many super busy clinicians. The whole process from, from, the, from the moment that the patient walks into the door and gets treated, until he gets treated, sorry, takes 123 minutes on average. And most of this time, is spent due to lack of care coordination. As we mentioned earlier, remember time is brain? 
for every minute that the patient is experiencing a stroke, two million neurons are lost. Now, let's imagine that you can skip all this process and just notify the right people on the right time. So now imagine that you had some black box that could detect the stroke early in the process and alert the relevant clinicians. That's our goal at VZI. We use AI to synchronize care by evaluating images and alerting the relevant care team of urgent pathology. Our system process images in the secure cloud and take less than three minutes from the completion of the scan to sending the alert. Greater than 90% of our alerts are read within five minutes of receipt by the intended specialist. So now let's review the workflow now embedded with this. The patient again walks in the door and gets a CT scan. Then the scan is uploaded for the, from the PACS to our cloud server and our algorithm process the scan. We know in advance who are the on-call physicians in every hospital, and we notify them when an LVO is detected in the region of care. Then the neurosurgeon or someone from his team, after investigating the scan, can just invite the patient to the cath lab to get treated, while the team performs all the relevant arrangements. We've seen significant time savings, coming down from 123 minutes to procedure to 39 minutes to procedure in stroke. As a result, we've seen significant improvements in patient outcomes. Now that we've discussed our use case, let's move to the core of our system, our, our uh, AI algorithms. We'll start with a brief introduction to AI. So what is AI? Artificial intelligence are the theory of practice of programming computers to perform cognitive or perception tasks. Machine learning is a subset of AI, where instead of defining the algorithm ourselves, we let the computer extract the rules and actually build the algorithm. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning that has been tremendously successful over the last, let's say, seven years and is based on artificial neural network. I will dive into it in the next slides. So the basic unit in deep learning is the neuron here on the right, oh, sorry. So, uh, and the artificial neuron is the way we try to mimic this behavior. There are inputs marked here with X1, X2, X3, which are assigned width and they are summed. And if it causes a certain threshold, then the artificial neuron fires the signal. Inspired by the way the brain works, there are billions of neurons. And like here on the left, they are connected in layers. Now let's review the high level design of a neural network for a very common problem in computer vision, face recognition. We start here on the left with the basic input feed with lots of faces, and we want to teach the machine how to recognize these people. First layer here detects relatively simple visual concepts like lines and rectangles. The more we go deeper, we start to detect features that are more and more complex. The output layer here on the right detects the most abstract representation of a face. So now that we've understood what is AI and how it works? Let's see how we, how we use AI in our algorithms to achieve our goals. So what we do at this is basically to convert years of research direction that were developed for totally different problems to fit our needs. Let's take, for example, this cat here. Uh, we want to detect it and label it and draw a rectangle and draw some bounding box around it, okay? We can actually use the same algorithms that used to detect this cat in order to detect and label a dense MCA. MCA stands for middle cerebral artery here in the image. Now let's discuss another very popular problem in computer vision segmentation. Now, not only that we're using a bounding box, 
but we're interested in specifying the exact pixels of the features and labeling it. So now the red, the red, pix, the red marked pixels are for the cat, the green one are for the duck, and the, the blue is for the dog. We can use the same algorithm that we used to segment this picture in order to segment an intracranial hemorrhage in a brain image. So now I would like to review our main algorithm, the LVO. It's, it's an algorithm for stroke detection. And I'll explain it step by step. So we first receive a CTA from the scanner. You can see here the vessel being highlighted since it's filled with contrast. First thing we do is to remove the skull. So we stay only with the soft matter. Then we apply geometric transformation on the image. So all scans appear in the same orientation. Then the deep learning magic starts and we train two neural networks. The first, the first one segments the MCAM1, again, middle cerebral artery. And the second one here provides the whole vessel segmentation in the relevant area. Then the two are combined to form the MCA tree. The algorithm traces the vessels and you can see that on the left side, it quickly arrived to a dead end. That would lead the algorithm to a decision that there's an occlusion there. Here, the occlusion is here marked in red. Then we take the algorithm results and combine it with several other methods that detect stroke. For example, we compare the AGU density of the two sides of the scan. And we're adding the scan quality so it will not cause any false positives due to low quality images. We use an algorithm called random forest to produce an LVO score. This score is our threshold. If it's above this threshold, then scan is considered positive to LVO and negative otherwise. This is roughly speaking how the LVO algorithm works. So you're probably asking yourself, how well does it work? So this is a publication from two years ago, 2020. This is an evaluation of what we call performance in the wild. The study consists of 2,500 patients consecutive cases from 130 different hospitals around the US. This is real data, no cherry pick, no exclusions. We process all the data that we got. A important note is that we included both PSC, PSC stands for Primary Stroke Center and CSC, Comprehensive Stroke Center. CSC usually have better equipment and more trained radiologists but the patients who really need us are usually in the PSC. So you can see the results here. Sensitivity is 96 and specificity is around 93. I think that those are, these are amazing results. I'll explain what does it mean. A test with 96 sensitivity will correctly return a positive result for 96 of people who have this disease, LVO in our case. Having over 90% sensitivity, we can go back for, for, to the patient from the earlier slide and accelerate his door to treatment from an average of 123 minutes into an average of 39 minutes. So where are we now? End of 2021, early 2022. We are installed in more than, in almost 1,000 hospitals around the US. We're detecting LVO every 36 seconds. We're launching way beyond stroke, initiating products in the field of cardiovascular and and the uh, vascular surgery. We're an organization of more than 200, um, sorry, more than 260 employees across four locations. And we have recently started to accelerate clinical trials 
by assisting the healthcare companies to better uh, detect the best patients for the clinical trials. And of course, we're hiring. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nama, for your talk. Um, as you mentioned that you're hiring, um, I know that in both countries, there is also always um, limited uh, skilled workforce, but maybe this is an option to uh, sort of have an exchange of uh, people from the Netherlands who would work um, at your company and, um, and maybe this is something to further discuss. Um, I'd like to move on to the next speaker, Dr. Thomas Kwee. Uh, was a trained uh, radiologist at the University Medical Center uh, of Utrecht, and uh, he works as a radiologist at the University Medical Center in Groningen, in, uh, in the north of uh, the Netherlands. Um, Thomas' main research interests are oncological imaging, healthcare policy and management, and value-based healthcare and artificial intelligence. And Thomas, you will tell us about the challenges for radiology in 2030, and you will address the question whether artificial intelligence can help. Marcelli, thank you for the uh, very kind introduction and organizing this symposium and of course inviting me. So let's move on to the, to the next lecture. I will share the screen with you. Can everyone see it? Okay. Uh, my name is Thomas Kwee, and in the coming uh, 50 minutes, I will give you a taste of what we do as radiologists, um, which uh, challenges we face, and how artis artificial intelligence can help. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And as Rachelle told, uh, I'm a radiologist. I, I perform a lot of research, and I'm also the vice chair of the department. And you can see a map of the Netherlands here. And, uh, uh, my hospital is located in the north of, uh, of our country, in the, in the city of Groningen. Uh, it has an academic hospital uh, with around 1,300 beds, and we provide healthcare services to around 3 million people. And as you can see, Tel Aviv, the beautiful city of Tel Aviv, is around 4,000 kilometers away from us. What we will discuss, I will, I will give you a taste what we do as a radiologist in daily practice, how our workload is increasing, what consequences this has on diagnostic errors and burnout, and how AI may help, and particularly what we need and what we don't need. And then we'll briefly summarize. What, we, what do we do in daily practice? Well, in um, most hospitals in the United States, Europe, Netherlands, wherever it is, most radiologists, they sit behind the workstation and they look at uh, images like this uh, the whole day long. But we also have other tasks. We discuss with referring clinicians about appropriate treatment management and which diagnostic studies they should undergo. We protocol studies, that is, we determine uh, which scan should be done and how the scan should be done. And we also perform diagnostic studies by ourselves. So think about ultrasound, which is a hands-on practice. And we perform a lot of interventions. Think about biopsies, tissue samplings, uh, drainages and um, other kinds of therapeutic uh, procedures. And we attend many multidisciplinary meetings in which other medical specialists attend and we give um, our input and our advice what to do with the patient. But for diagnostic radiologists, more than 90% of the time is spent here behind the workstation reading images. Then we can make a nice comparison. Um, a radiologist is sitting behind um, high-tech equipment, and it's almost similar to um, a pilot sitting in a cockpit. Then I'll ask you this question, what is the difference between them? Well, before answering that question, I will first go back to 2007. In 2007, a famous radiologist, uh, Dr. Hillman, um, he has written an ed editorial in um, an American journal, and he mentioned that Everyone involved in medical imaging is working harder. In 2007. What does this mean and why does he say that? Well, let's, let's look at the numbers. This is a publication in the, in the JAMA. And here we can see data from the United States and Ontario. We have different age groups. 
65 and older, between 18 and 64 years, and at age 18 years, for th these are patients. And on the y-axis, you can see the number of examinations we do. And on the x-axis, you can see the time in years. So from 2000 to 2016. And as you can see, the number of examinations is increasing over time. And it keeps on increasing. And we have particularly growth in CT and MRI in adults. So Dr. Hillman, he already said in 2007 that we are working harder. And this graph goes until 2016. And we are now in 2022. What are we doing now? Are we working extremely hard or are we working too hard maybe? Of course, this contributes to the workload of a radiologist, the increasing number of scans. These were data from the United States and Canada. Uh, but if you look um, in our own hospital, we see a similar trend. It, this happens anywhere in, in any hospital, in Israel, Europe, America, wherever. Leo, Leo, can you please mute yourself? Mm -hmm. No, let's, let's, anyway, let's continue with, uh, with our talk. So, uh, the workload is increasing. Um, One second, let's just wait a second because it's very hard to hear. Um, Leo? Daniel, is there a way to mute Leo? Thanks. And also, Jacques, if you can mute yourself. Okay, we're back online, Sorry. I guess. Uh, Sorry, yes. No problem. So um, the number of scans is increasing. And there is another important factor that increases our workload. We do a lot of night shifts. Medical doctors, they're increasingly relying on medical imaging to make a correct diagnosis and then start the treatment. So they're increasingly ne needing us in, uh, in, in the night. There was one study in the Netherlands um, and they have shown that within the past 15 years, our workload has quadrupled. So we're working four times harder in the evenings and in the nights. Another important thing is that um, the complexity of the scans that we have to evaluate is also increasing. So consider an MRI scan of the brain, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, we only had these four images we had to look at, but the technology keeps on increasing. We can scan faster and we scan more. So nowadays we have to look at this set of images for one MRI brain. There's one, there's one study performed in 2010, which is already two, 12 years ago, and they showed that within, between 1999 and 2010, the number of images that we need to interpret per minute increased from three to 16. So five times more for a radiologist to, to interpret. And if you look at an, an eight hour workday, a radiologist has to look at one CT or armor image every three to four seconds, the whole day long. So you can imagine what it means for the brain of a radiologist. Well, I can hear you say, uh, okay, we do more scans and they get more complex, but um, you get paid more money for that, isn't it? Well, this is, uh, I wish it were true, but it is not. Um, imaging is subject to the so-called diamonds water paradox. What is this? Well, this paradox says that Water is more useful than diamonds, but it is cheaper because water is, is ubiquitous. It's all over the place, while diamonds are scarce. And imaging is becoming as ubiquitous as water. Consider 20 years ago, uh, we only had a few MRI uh, or CT systems in the hospital, and the scans were expensive. But now we have these systems all over the place. And because we have so much of it, uh, there's no scarcity anymore, and um, the price keeps on decreasing of a scan. What does this mean? Well, radiologists, they remain relatively scarce because it takes a lot of money to train them. Imaging reimbursements are declining. So we have to do more with less. 
You have to work harder, but less. Now, then we come back to the real audience. What uh, if you face the real audience with this, um, uh, with this topic? What, what does he answer? There are two options. Either we work harder, we work longer. That is, we keep on working in evenings or in the weekends. Or we can put more work in the same period of time. If you ask radio list, what do you prefer? They will say, we prefer working more efficiently. That is, we will do more within the same amount of time. This is an, uh, an, an interesting news item that was published in the, in the media in Turkey. Um, and in this hospital, they mentioned that patient density, so the number of scans we do, negatively affects our quality, our diagnostic accuracy. And in this center, uh, this was dedicated to breast MRI. The whole day long, they were reporting one breast MRI scan per two minutes to finish all the work on time. Then going back to aviation and answer the question, what is the difference between a radiologist and a pilot considering these data? The answer is diagnostic errors. If you look at data in the United States in 2020, and this is known from the literature, radiologists have an error rate of around three to 5%. And there are around 40 to 80,000 deaths because of diagnostic errors in the United States. Compare it to civil aviation in the United States in 2020. There were only 11 accidents and no one died. Remarkable, isn't it? Workload, very important. Uh, it is well known that it is associated with diagnostic errors. There are, there are many other factors that um, cause diagnostic error, but workload is one of them. One example, here you can see a chest X-ray and this lung cancer was missed. The arrow shows a lesion in the right lower lobe of the lung. Very hard to spot on this X-ray. And if you have to report 100 X-rays on one day, you can imagine that you can miss this. Later on, because the patient had complaints, a CT scan was made, and you can see a large mass in the lung. But on the chest X-ray, it's very hard to spot. And this one was missed in clinical practice. What are the consequences? One of them is patient harm. That's, of course, the most important. But what does it do to the radiologist? Well, the radiologist will face medical legal consequences. There are costs involved in making errors. And don't underestimate, it gives a lot of psychological distress to a radiologist. The workload and missing diagnosis gives a lot of this distress to the radiologist. And as has already been um, mentioned in one of the previous presentations, burnout is increasing among radiologists. It's an increasing trend. You see it also in the, in the scientific literature. Going back to aviation, because they're doing well. Since the beginning of commercial aviation, each successive generation of aircraft has become increasingly automated. And this, has, this automation has contributed to a step change in efficiency and safety. So this is one of the tools that the pilot has on board. It is an automatic flight control system. It has fancy tools like, like flight detect directors, autopilots, auto throttles, auto land and navigational aids to improve efficiency and safety. And we have to uh, make this step too in radiology. We have to increase our safety and efficiency. And I'll give you a few examples of um, in the literature how AI systems can uh, uh, help us to achieve this goal. This is a patient with lung cancer. So imagine you're a radiologist. Uh, there are 100 scans to be reported and they keep on increasing and then you get phone calls. Can anyone spot the, the lung cancer on this X-ray? Very hard to detect. Well, these investigators from, um, um, from Korea, they developed uh, an AI algorithm and it helped to detect lung cancer. Now, as I put the error on it, it's easy to see, but if you do have this in a prospective reading, very high probability that it can be missed. In this study, um, the, uh, the AI algorithm was better than radiologist in detecting lung cancer um, in clinical practice and may be helpful uh, as a second reader, as a, an aid to the radiologist. 
another example pulmonary embolism pulmonary embolism that means there's a blood clot in one of the pulmonary arteries you have to detect this on time because it's a life, potentially life-threatening conditioning in this study an ai system was developed and they showed that it was quite good at detecting pulmonary embolism we may use it to automatically prioritize exams in a reading list what does this mean Every radiologist who works with a digital system like a box has um, a work list. And then the older scans have to be reported first. The new scans, they appear on the bottom of the list and it will be reported later, maybe two days later, three days later, whatever. Can everybody still see my screen? Now we see a red screen. Yeah, mine has also turned red for some reason. Um, So can I, can I continue after this musical interruption? Okay, one second, just I want to be sure something regarding safety, I will uh, ask uh, of Neil. Um, yeah, there, is, there, is a, there is a name which I think you should also remove. I'm not yeah. sure. All these people. Well, I am so sorry. I've never experienced yeah. it. Yeah. I, I wish they would have selected better music, to be honest, but uh, 
yeah, it's, <laughs> um, it, it could have been worse, I think. Yeah, so there's still people here that should not be in our meeting. Maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can use a new link um and or it's it's safer to be here what do you think um, okay there is another person that you can remove you see the one with the smiley so i think i think it's a uh, neil i think it's neil no no oh, no no, neil, neil, oh, no, no. Not me. Yeah. Okay. Underneath not neil, yeah you're smiling naturally <laughs> Oh, no, there's a person that we can see in a participant list underneath uh, Gen, if you can remove that person as well. Yeah, with the, with the smiling. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So, <sighs> except my, my apologies, I've never experienced such a thing. I didn't know that such things exist. Uh, Thomas, sorry, and uh, we will continue with your presentation. I really apologize. No problem, Rashid. Can you see my presentation again? Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. So, um, so we we uh, we were busy with the pulmonary embolism detection with the AI algorithm. Um, as a radiologist, we have a working list, and uh, the older study appears first. But if we use the AI algorithm, it can um, spot the pulmonary embolism in um, one of the new scans, and it can. Uh, bring it to the top of the list and bring it to the attention of the radiologist and uh, then we can detect uh, make this diagnosis uh, in an early stage instead of two or three days later uh, when it doesn't matter anymore uh, and we can start treatment in a timely manner one more example um, breast cancer um, in this study they used an ai system to, de to detect breast cancer he can see a square uh, and the, the lesion is indicated very hard to spot with the, with the human eye but it is there um, and this study showed that it was better than the radiologist. Um, and in screening mammography, of course, we always have two readers. Um, and this could be used as a second reader to reduce workload with 88%. So this increases both safety and efficiency. Now, one important thing is what, what don't we need from AI? We do not want is unreliable AI. That is, if you have too many false positives, then we have too many additional examinations that are not necessary or we have unnecessary treatments and we don't want too many false negatives because then we send the patient home um, although there is disease that needs to be treated and another important point is that uh, we don't need ai that increases our workload and this is a very important thing if it um, if ai requires extra post-processing time or extra interpretation time for the radiologist then this is not what we want um, if you look in the literature, in the past literature, um, many studies are being published in, um, um, and most of these studies, they contribute to healthcare, they improve what we do. But they also increase the workload of radiologists and this particularly applies to AI studies because many of them, they increase our uh, post-processing and interpretation time. One example, this is prostate cancer. Uh, you can see the lesion here in the prostate. These are MRI scans. Uh, and in this study, um, uh, the AI system was almost equal to the radiologist, but it took a lot more time uh, to evaluate. We had to put all kinds of circles around the lesion, and it took a lot of time. It's a very laborious. So this is what we don't need. An example of what we need, um, this, is, this is a more recent study. And in this study, uh, the prostate cancer was almost automatically delineated, and then the features were extracted uh, with the use of the AI system. Uh, and it was even more accurate than the radiologist. Uh, and it also was less time consuming uh, than a radiologist doing this task. To summarize, um, a radiologist job um, looks like that of a pilot in some respects, but we make more errors and uh, a pilot makes much less errors. We have less automation, they have more. Our workload is increasing, therefore uh, diagnostic errors and burnout are also increasing. Um, and we need, we really need AI to help with safety and efficiency, but keep in mind, uh, accuracy is very important and we don't want increased workloads. Uh, I would like to finish with a quote from Abraham Lincoln. 
uh, the best best way to predict your future is to create it. So we have to work together to um, to bring these solutions to the real world. Thank you for your attention. And um, with these words um, and a nice musical introduction in between, I would like to give the world uh, the world to the next uh, speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas, for your great presentation. And also, we very much like the analogy uh, between the radiologist and the uh, and the pilot. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ayelet uh, Axelrod Balin, who is the vice president of uh, R&D at Nanox, previ uh, Nanox AI, previously uh, Zebra Medical Vision. And Ayelet will tell us about transforming healthcare with AI. Ayelet um, has been leading the research and engineering departments in developing state-of-the-art FDA-approved AI healthcare products. Prior to joining Zebra Medical Vision, she was the medical imaging research technology led lead at IBM Research Haifa in Israel. Ayelet, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rachelle and the team for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, indeed, I, I am the VP of R&D of uh, Nanox AI, previously known as Zebra Medical Vision, and I will now uh, share my presentation. Um, just a minute, yeah, share, and here we go. So, and and I'm happy to talk about transforming healthcare with AI. And of course, all of us are aware of the amazing breakthrough that AI has brought to our lives. Uh, we recently have seen uh, uh, mobilize uh, supervision and Tesla's autopilot, and also uh, a, um, a development in terms of uh, NLP by OpenAI, for example, GPT-3, which is a language model that uses deep learning to generate text and produced uh, produce text that is actually very close to human level. And uh, in this last year, we've seen extensions of OpenAI on this, uh, which build, um, allow us to generate images based on text captions. And of course, uh, healthcare has followed uh, up with these progress and developments. And uh, in a recent paper from last year, uh, we can see a list of the FDA uh, um, uh, AI approved uh, product in the term of radiology. And uh, of course, every day more and more products are out there and, uh, and get approved. And this is an, an indeed an uh, uh, interesting journey. And of course, uh, the, the speakers before me mentioned um, the motivation that all of us in this field have uh, for this, the huge number of studies, uh, Thomas mentioned the workload, the increase in workload, the increase in procedures, uh, the number of trained radiologists is, uh, is insufficient in many development, developing countries. The process is error prone, as, as the speaker before me mentioned, and radiologists are expensive. And of course, we know that early diagnosis and treatment is critical. The question is, can AI transform healthcare and radiology as it does in other domains? And um, being in this, in this journey for, for, for several years, I, I, see, I see that all of us working here, are still, we're still not there. there are, and, and this is probably due to many challenges. Uh, some of the challenges in the development in the technology world is the low prevalence of some of the findings. Some of the findings, you just can't find enough of them in the data. Uh, the subtle fine-grained visual categories. Thomas showed uh, the finding in a mammography image, comparing that to images my colleagues in computer vision work with, where you have a huge horse covering 25% of the image, whereas your findings is maybe 1% of the image, the acquisition artifact that you need to deal with, the size of the data, if you have a colon and you take a video of it, uh, the amount of data that is produced can be sometimes huge. Uh, the anatomical and finding variability, the variations between machine and protocols that make it difficult to generalize to a new machine in somewhere else in the world, uh, the significant intra and inter-observer variability that sometimes make, uh, make, us, make it very difficult to us to get in a good agreement uh, between radiologists uh, and the uh, um, interpretability and, re and uh, explainability that we want to produce to the clinicians that we work with in order for them to have uh, a good reliability, as also Thomas mentioned before me. So, 
However, uh, at uh, Nanox AI, we, we have managed to, to uh, obtain or achieve uh, nine FDA-approved products, 11 CE-marked products, uh, some more on the way, and in, in multiple domains, uh, we have bone health solution, cardiac solutions, neuro solutions, chest solution, in, in, the, in, some in, the, in the CT modality, some for chest x-ray, we have an orthopedic solution, which is actually a reconstruction of uh, 3D, of 2D, taking 2D x-ray images and producing 3D, three-dimensional shapes. And we also have a mammography solution. So Efrat also uh, uh, showed this, and this is indeed a wide variety of, of products, but still, uh, what 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 I want to actually discuss today is what are the key components that are needed in order for radiology and AI in radiology and in healthcare to achieve this level of uh, of accuracy and quality that we see in 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 the computer vision or the NLP domain. So first of all, it's the data, and then when when I'm talking about data, I'm not talking about small amounts of that. I'm talking about millions and billions of images and texts that at the level that, uh, at the, and the amount that Tesla or, um, or Mobileye or OpenAI are using for their networks. And in order to train net, such big networks and huge networks, this is the, the, this is the amount, this is what I envision, this, the, this size of data. And I think also Efrat has mentioned it. And in order to scale up in, in terms of data, you also need to scale up in terms of the labels that you use. So you need to in, in, incorporate a, a labels coming from you know, weak labels. So labels coming from EMR, labels coming from text, uh, uh, labels that are not produced ne manually necessarily. So we cannot rely on the radiologist to really tag all our data. It's really unsustainable. And, and luckily, the, the field of NLP has also progressed uh, significantly in the last couple of years. So we, we all know we have personal assistance, we have autocomplete uh, applications, we have spell checking applications, we have machine tra translations, and all of this rely on state of the art uh, uh, deep learning technology, as I mentioned for GPT-3, you have question answering, completion, summarization, reading comprehension, and this uh, is really something that needs need to be in, needs to be incorporated in healthcare and in radiology, and we like others uh, are actually doing that. So we have uh, applications for multi-finding chest X-rays that rely on millions of, of chest X-rays and reports that are actually attached to them. And these reports are all, always a report that the radiologist produced in the study level. It actually complicates things for us because the finding is it will appear at the image level. So this is something that you need to, to, take, to, to, to take into account when you develop such systems. And, um, and we also make, make use of such approaches and deep learning technologies in NLP and in imaging when we developed our head CTICH FDA approved product where, where we and the, and, the, and the arrow between the reports and the images is actually a dual arrow because the NLP is trained based on the imaging and the imaging can be trained based on the NLP and actually today there are self self supervised approaches where you have a, a dual representation of both the images and the text, which allow you to take into account uh, uh, multiple modalities. And of course, still, you still have this difficulty that the label is weak. So you have in a study, um, a multiple series uh, that are, can be of different contrast, and uh, not in all of them you'll see your finding. And of course, the finding appear, doesn't appear in the entire volume, it's in a selective set of slices, but still you want to be able to localize it and to present it to the radiologist exactly where you're finding it and where you are reporting it when you are developing AI. The third component that you need to to take to to that one that wants to build uh, AI for healthcare needs to build is actually the workflow. So you have to have a secure 
lean, real-time AI workflow. And here in the chart, you see a simplification of such a workflow, but actually this workflow needs to be, to be adapted to every type of product that you have. And this is an important uh, thing to, to, to be aware of. So just the simplification uh, is that you have a, a chess CT acquired, uh, ingested into the packs, uh, delivered to the cloud after anonymization. You, where, there you would have an AI engine and you would you send the insights back to the radiologist or to an executive in order to view uh, the results in a summarization um, way. And, uh, and uh, we, we actually focus our products today on in, in for population health. So you, we, we actually recently received this, uh, two related CPT codes, both for our bone health solution and for uh, coronary calcium identification. And in, in the case of population health, what we do is we leverage routine chest abdomen CTs to identify and manage highly prevalent previously undiagnosed chronic conditions. And in terms of uh, CCS or coronary calcium uh, identification, here the, the workflow inside would look like this. You would ingest a non-gated, non-contrast chest CT, and the pipeline based on multiple networks will have a lo heart localization, a calcium segmentation, and a coronary calcium um, scoring mechanism, which will allow you to categorize your finding and findings. And eventually, you can, you can find three cat coronary calcium calcium categories correlating with the existing standouts. And um, here you can see uh, the finding and uh, patients identified with medium or high coronary artery calcium will progress to appropriate treatment. One second. And okay, so and another important component, and this is a more focused on maybe technology, but I think it's important to understand uh, and I think that in the domain of computer vision and machine learning and NLP, this is very well understood, but not necessarily in all the healthcare uh, uh, companies. Uh, we need to have an automatic infrastructure to deal with the, the, the high scale of data and labels that we need in order to get the accuracy and the scale up that we are planning. Uh, we need to build the, an automatic system where you have the training, training set and, train, and, and data tables produced automatically. You, you need to have the data loaders and data caching done automatically. You need to have a model zoo that allows you to easily select and easily build components into your workflow. And then you have this output coming out where you have an architecture that is the model, uh, which will probably be an ensemble of models and which you need to do inference to and you need to evaluate on and have some sort of report which is clear and allows you to understand if you're, you're good and you can deploy or whether you need to, to retrain and actually go to your unlabeled pool of data and smartly select which is the data that you will you you and which what are the annotations that will improve your model? And then you have this oracle, um, which hopefully will not be manual, but be, will be more automatic, which will lead to new labels and allow you to retrain. And this is the this is the process that uh, actually is uh, supported by many MLOps uh, uh, applications, uh, which includes the data preparation and the training and the the what will allow you to do rapid deployments. And all of this, I believe, needs to be part of the way we develop AI in healthcare. And of course, uh, uh, in, in this process, the, the, you still have uh, to have an efficient tagging operation. So you want to minimize the amount of annotation that you need for manual annotation by doing auto-labeling and weekly semi-supervised approaches, as I mentioned, and having this active learning uh, uh, feedback that I described in the previous slide. But you also want to have, um, eventually, when you need the tagging, you want to do it in a smart way. You want to have a selection and training of the taggers that you have. You want to have quality control. Bad tags are very, very difficult. So you want to make sure that you have a quality uh, attached to the tags that you have. And you have, and you want to do this fast. So you want to have a task decomposition that will allow you to do this in a parallel way. 
And finally, I am uh, from the, I was educated in the times where uh, labeled face in the wild, I don't know who of you is familiar from, with it, was actually a challenge uh, and uh, it was not, and, in, and, and groups competed and I was one of them, uh, competed in the, in, to, to get high accuracy uh, for labeling faces. Uh, my, or I envision that, and although that we, this is a long journey, I think that this is what, uh, what will happen with health, healthcare too. So in 2019, um, 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 machine learning uh, achieved a human performance in, in, in face detection and face recognition in these sort of challenges. I believe that in some of the applications, uh, machines will be able to, to assist uh, radiologists, to, to assist clinicians and healthcare pr uh, practitioners. And this is actually, and this will actually be uh, to the benefit of patients and, and to get improved healthcare. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ayelet, for your excellent presentation. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Bram van Geneken from Radboud University Medical Center, also in the Netherlands. Um, maybe because we're also talking or trying to talk a little bit about the collaboration between Israel and the Netherlands. So at the time in June 2016, when, not long, long after I started working as innovation at the SHED, there was a delegation from uh, the Netherlands visiting Israel, and among others was the president, the at the time president of uh, the Rockbout uh, University uh, in Nijmegen, and a, uh, an MOU was signed between Rockbout and uh, Tel Aviv University. I also visited the, uh, the university, and they're very eager to develop uh, cooperation with the Netherlands. Um, so having said that, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Bram van Geneke, who will tell us about AI, will AI, make radiology more or less expensive. And a few words about you. Um, you're a professor of medical image analysis at uh, Radboud University Medical Center, and you chair the diagnostic image analysis group. You also worked for, um, you also worked for Fraunhofer, M-E-V-I-S in Bremen in Germany, and you are the founder of Thyrona, a company that develops software and provides services for medical image analysis. And we're pleased to hear your uh, presentation, Bram. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. You can hear me well? Yes, we hear you well. All right, good. And then I'll try to share the screen. Um, yeah, so I would like to address the question um, maybe continuing from what many of the uh, previous speakers already said is uh, how are we going to implement this AI in radiology and if we do that, will it eventually make AI uh, make radiology more or less expensive because the first speaker already gave uh, some uh, very big uh, important numbers on the costs of healthcare. So um, I lead a, a research group and we work with a lot of different companies also bringing our software to the market. So let me start by, yeah, where are we now with AI and radiology? So this, this journey, um, as, as several speakers already call, called it, started a long time ago. This is the first publication that I found about analyzing radiology images with a computer from 1963. And it's, it's still a very interesting paper. I recommend everybody to read it. I'll just read out the opening sentence. This paper describes a concept of converting visual images on X-rays into numerical sequences that can be manipulated and evaluated by the digital computer. Um, and actually, for almost half a century, we were not that, ex, uh, um, that successful with it until deep learning came along. And deep learning, interestingly, does something uh, slightly different. What Lotwick proposes uh, is that you convert visual images to numerical sequences, because numerical sequences, well, rows of numbers, can be manipulated and evaluated by the digital computer. But the images cannot be directly evaluated by the computer. This, this was the kind of state of the art in 1963. And the key innovation by deep learning is that you actually put the images into a very long network extract features from it and make classifications. And it really started to take off after 2012. 
Um, and it started to be applied in medical image analysis and was uh, super successful. And this is the review we published in uh, 2017, where we actually reviewed every paper at that time that was published on applications of deep learning and medical image analysis. And now almost every publication on medical image analysis uses deep learning. And interestingly, six years ago, it's now exactly, no, it's now exactly five years ago, one of the godfathers of deep learning, Jeffrey Hinton, said for the first time in public something about radiology. And it was actually a statement that shocked radiologists uh, worldwide. What he said was, um, he was asked, what, what are exciting things that are to come? And Hinton said, let me start by saying a few things that are obvious. Um, really, if you work as a radiologist, you don't realize that, um, Computers are taking over your work. Uh, there's no ground underneath you. We should stop training radiologists now because it's completely obvious within five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. Uh, well, it might be 10 years, but we have enough radiologists already. Now, if you analyze what he actually said, it's important to realize that he made two different statements. He said within five or 10 years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists and as a consequence, we should stop training radiologists now. So that's what he said five years ago. Well, he was widely ridiculed and attacked for the second statement, um, but less people discussed whether the first statement was actually uh, correct or not. And now we should know because we're now five years after he made this statement. Now, as, as many of you already mentioned, this is now real. Um, this is a very nice uh, paper by a group from, uh, from Zurich in Switzerland, making an overview of the uh, machine learning medical devices that are available on the market now. What they show in this paper is this steady increase of the number of uh, products that have become uh, available and that are certified, either CE certified or FDA cleared. And what you also see is that more than half of these products come from radiology. So like one of the previous speakers already said, radiology is here leading the way. Um, now we maintain uh, an overview of uh, all the products that are available for radiology. And we actually also organize a lot of challenges. The previous speaker was mentioning a computer vision challenge, but there are also hundreds of challenges for developing software to analyze medical images. And uh, you can do that on our platform uh, where everybody can set up such a such a competition. This is one we're running now about uh, COVID-19 with a huge database from uh, the French uh, uh, government that uh, uh, you can use here to train your algorithms. But we offer here an overview of commercial products and you can see that right now there are 188 CE cleared products for AI in radiology on the market and they are produced by almost uh, 100 companies. Uh, now, that's fantastic. We now have these 200 products available. Question is, of course, are they good enough to really uh, help radiologists? Uh, I think many of these products really are good enough. Not all of them. It's super important that we actually validate how well these uh, products work. This is also one of the things we are doing with this overview. We started a project where we are going to compare uh, products that address a similar task and actually compare how they do on an independent data set. And we run this on our Grand Challenge platform. For example, previously uh, we had here a talk from VizAI about their stroke product. There are actually a number of companies available and uh, we are all inviting them uh, to join this uh, validation study to see if these products all meet the requirements. And we really hope that VizAI is also willing to join in this effort. Now, going back to Hinton, I believe the first statement is correct. We are now five years after his statement able to build systems that interpret medical images with a performance that is similar to radiologists. And the big, um, I would say, uh, the, the big achievement is that we can now actually fairly easily build these systems. And that's a great step forward. And that's thanks, thanks to the uh, progress in deep learning that we're now able to do that. I, was, I want to just illustrate this with one example. We could show many more, but this is one of the products that we show on our website. It's a French product for detecting fractures in, uh, in X-rays. And this is the big publication they made in radiology where they showed the performance of their uh, system. And what I found very interesting here is that in this um, paper, um, they basically said, how did we build this system? Well, we collected a lot of data. 
Then we went to um, a public website where there's a freely available tool by Facebook called Detectron 2, and we trained it with Detectron 2, and that was our product. So this shows that we now have publicly, freely available, in fact, software with which you can build uh, yeah, commercially great software that you can actually get CE and FDA approved. So therefore, um, I think we can now fairly easily build these systems. And over time, when these deep learning tools will become more widely available, it will become even easier to build such systems. We still need to collect this data, and that's a very important task, as also mentioned by previous uh, speakers. So it's still time consuming, but it is possible. Now, I think the mistake that Hinton made was to assume that if we can build such systems that perform individual tasks of radiologists, it means we need to stop train radiologists. And that, that's just a, uh, uh, an error in thinking that he made this uh, conclusion. Now let's look a bit at healthcare, because this is where we operate. Um, and this is a report that recently came out and that was uh, heavily discussed in the, Dutch, um, uh, in the Dutch press and also played an important role in the formation of our new government. Um, one of the things our government said is we have a huge problem in healthcare. The costs are exploding. And this, product, uh, this uh, um, report shows that uh, when I was born, 1970, we had one out of 12 people in the working population working in healthcare. And at the moment, that's one out of six. So the percentage of people working in healthcare has just doubled. That's uh, an enormous thing. But the thing is, if trend continues, then in 2060, one out of three people will work in healthcare. And if you just analyze this, it's pretty obvious that this is not possible. We don't have enough people. And if we would put so many people in healthcare, we would not have enough people to do all the other work that also needs to be done uh, in the society. So we really have to find a solution. And I think the most uh, promising solution, because this problem is discussed a lot, but basically I see very few concrete suggestions how we're going to solve it. The concrete suggestion I see is to simply replace a lot of these people who work in healthcare with computers, because that would allow us basically to do the same amount of work with less people and in this way keep healthcare affordable. So Bringing me to the central question, is AI going to make healthcare more affordable and more expensive? And how is that going right now? Then I notice that from these 200 products that are now on the market, the vast, vast majority aims to assist a radiologist. And this is very nice, but this means that it will drive up costs because hospitals now need to buy software, which is not free, and they still need to pay the salary of all these radiologists, unless, as uh, one of the previous speakers, uh, Thomas Clay mentioned, radiologists can read much faster. However, if you look at the literature and if you look at how products are marketed, very few studies address reading time and target this specifically. In fact, almost all products say, if you use our product as a radiologist, you will become a better radiologist. And if you look at the ROC curves that are presented, we see typically a modest increase in sensitivity at the same specificity. Really think of a few percent better. On the other hand, if we would make an AI product that would replace a task now performed by a human expert by a task uh, performed by a computer, this will reduce costs. And then the goal is cost reduction and throughput increase. And it will be nice if the quality does not go down too much. But this is a different approach. And this is actually what I think um, the only sensible strategy, how you can use AI to keep healthcare affordable. Now, why do companies not market their products like this? Why they, do they actually market their products as a, an assistant to the radiologist rather than something that replaces a task of a radiologist. Well, one of that is simply that, yeah, it's a business strategy. If you have a product and you have a customer, you want to be nice to the customer. So if you see the radiologist as your customer, you're not saying, I'm going to replace you. No, you're saying, I'm going to help you if you buy my product. And you can also think of this as just a, a matter of time. We will start with assistance. And then gradually, if the users, the customers find out that the software actually detects all the pulmonary embolisms, et cetera, they will just follow the advice of the computer and basically 
we are starting to do automation. This, this is something that could happen. But I think this, this strategy of only aiming to assist radiologists is at the moment backfiring. Maybe not in Israel, but certainly in the Netherlands and in other countries in Europe, there is no reimbursement for this software. And actually, if you ask authorities, do you want to reimburse uh, a product? Oh, we were trying to keep the costs uh, down, which will make a doctor like 2% better. They say, yeah. And if you would ask radiologists, can you do your task without computer support? They would all say, yes, of course I can. So there is not really, uh, yeah, an, an, a really interesting use case here to uh, ask for a lot of money for buying all this assistance software. So I think companies could focus on an alternative strategy and emphasize that their products can reduce the workload and therefore save costs. And that might actually lead to reimbursement. And the interesting thing is these products are starting to appear as well. This is a product not for radiology, but for ophthalmology, uh, where people take fundus photographs to see if people have diabetic retinopathy. And this is actually the first product that was approved a few years ago by the FDA for autonomous use. So this product analyzes fundus photographs, no human needs to look at it, and the software determines whether somebody gets referred to an ophthalmologist. And I worked with uh, the people who started this company a long time ago. This is a publication we did actually already in 2008 in Diabetes Care about the performance of the software we had at the time. We compared our software, which was not based on deep learning, but on machine learning at the time with three uh, expert ophthalmologists. And actually in the reader study, the software outperformed one of the ophthalmologists. And when we were writing the paper, I said, oh, this is fantastic. Let's put that prominently in the paper. But the first author, Michael Abramov, who then founded this company, uh, IDX, said, no, no, we can't say that because they, they may think that the software is trying to replace uh, the ophthalmologist. And, and it's a bit hidden here in the discussion section of this paper, if you read it, that we actually were outperforming one of the human readers. Now, now this message is not so uh, shocking anymore. Um, but still, if you ask radiologists, there's a lot of discussion about that. And many say uh, autonomous AI, we shouldn't do that. We should just aim on assisting the radiologists. So this debate, I expect, is going to continue for the next decade. But there are other products in radiology on the market that work like this. This is Bone Expert. This is a software that's probably the most widely used AI software in radiology in the Netherlands. Many, many hospitals use it. It analyzes a hand X-ray and gives you the bone age. And what the company in Denmark who makes this software found a couple of years ago is that in fact, half of their customers reported that they no longer look at the images. They just um, run the software and the pediatricians who order these exams, they look up the bone uh, age and no radiologist is involved anymore. And Bone Expert or uh, um, the company behind it is now really marketing this product as a replacement and not as an assistant. Another example is software that I developed or started to develop many, many years ago in my PhD, and we CE certified it in 2014. It's for reading chest X rays and indicating if the, uh, the subject on the X ray might have tuberculosis, so you should do a microbacteriological test. Um, this software is operational. This is an old slide. It's now operational, I think, in over 50 countries. It's uh, processing many, many uh, thousands of, uh, of X-rays uh, every day, um, and it's used as an automated reader. But when the WHO reviewed this software in 2016 and made a recommendation, they actually refused to make a recommendation to use this software. They said the evidence that this software works well enough is not yet uh, good enough. We need to do more research. We cannot recommend the use of this software right now, which I found disappointing. Uh, but this recommendation of the WHO did lead to new funding to do more studies. There's now also different software for this task on the market. And this is one example of a study that came out last year where um, a group uh, compared five different commercially available software packages for TB detection on an independent data set. And they actually found that all five software packages, including ours, outperformed human readers at uh, all the three relevant operating points that they analyzed here. Uh, and interestingly, in 2021, the World Health Organization made for the first time 
a recommendation to use a computer uh, for interpretation of a medical image in place of human readers. So they actually recommend not that you use it as an assistant, they recommend that you use it as a replacement. So we are moving in this direction. Um, and that's where I want to end with. I do think it, it makes a difference. If you develop software to run autonomously, there are a couple of things that you really have to pay attention to. There's now no human looking anymore at the, uh, at the picture. So if there is like a big abnormality and you would miss it, there would be consequences. So making sure that your software not only has good sensitivity specificity, but also asks, uh, can I actually process this image? Isn't it a difficult case? Uh, do I not make a big mistake here? Is the image of sufficient quality? All of these tasks are then also the responsibility of the AI. So that's something that we really have to um, consider if we eventually move to software that actually reduces the workload of, uh, of human experts. And I think that's the only way to keep healthcare affordable. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And just a thought that came to my mind is that maybe now that um, the technology is assisting in the uh, diagnosis of the um, of the images, one could also move into the field of uh, precision medicine because we could look at two areas. That means one is the area where there's a pathology or whether we see the disease, but also in the meantime, look at another area where we think that we can do something regarding the treatment and link those two and then get to a higher level of, um, of analysis and also of diagnosis regarding the uh, personal medicine treatment. Yep. Having said that, I would like to move to our um, next speaker, um, Dr. Michal Gindi, who is the head of venture and innovation and the director of imaging services at the Asuta Medical Centers. And uh, Michal will tell us about AI in, uh, in radiology uh, and give us a clinical uh, perspective. Michal specialized in radiology and is still practicing as a, a breast radiologist. She worked uh, for Maccabi Healthcare, which is one of Israel's four uh, health medical organizations. And there she held several managerial positions. And she was also responsible for radiology, telemedicine, laboratory, including pathology lab, pharmacy, and a call center. And for the last six years, uh, Michal is heading the, image, uh, the imaging uh, department at the Asuta Medical Centers and is responsible for running the seven image centers across Israel, producing over 600,000 studies annually. Michal, I welcome you. If you can unmute yourself, then uh, we can hear you. Michal? Yes, hi. Uh, so hello everyone. I really want to thank uh, the organizers for this meeting. I've actually enjoyed the talks that uh, my predecessors have spoken uh, enormously. And it is always uh, a pleasure to see other people in the same field that I'm doing and hearing their perspective and seeing um, a lot of similarities on the one hand and the uniqueness of every uh, perspective on the other and I think the lectures were really wonderful so thank you for the lecturers and for the organizers um, I will uh, you know being the last one I think I am the last one uh, maybe some of what I'm going to uh, what I intended to say would be repetition and I'll try to uh, not do that in in the manner of uh, speaking so uh, here I am I'll share my screen which again is, is not an option, but see. I, I uh, apologize, but um, because I left. Uh, Maybe I'll just mention it after your talk, Michal, there is going to be another presentation. And um, as we had this interference, um, I hope you can stay a few minutes longer so that we can hear all the speakers that uh, prepared for this uh, mini symposium. Michal, would you like of now to Yes, share please, please do. Okay. Although it's better if I do it because then I can okay. forward it in my speed, but um, something is uh, screwed no my problem. Mel, can you help us with the presentation of Michal? 
session. If there is anyone that can, I don't want to see it. One second, I asked him this. Wait, wait, wait. I am sorry. It did work before. We did try it. Khalif Nell is also helping. He's going to upload your presentation. Okay. Okay. Just one sec. So why don't I I spend a few minutes uh, until I talk? Because anyhow, normally I I have a presentation and I don't stick to it. So uh, maybe this the the system knew that this is me. So it's not a problem. Why don't I spend a few minutes, um, um, you know, sort of free talking about my perspective, um, and and I think really the the fact that I come from radiology and I became the head of uh, innovation says the story in a way, because it 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 does steam from what we've said several times in the talking here that uh, radiology, and at least AI and also other aspects of innovation really marry well and they go hand in hand for many years in most places and uh there there's several uh articles about why radiology is a good choice for that and um most of which was actually mentioned before but i think there are two things that should be mentioned and that weren't mentioned and the fact the fact one thing is that um most radiologists myself not included actually work in a no patient care scenario so they sit with images they don't have patients and it is and somewhat easier for them to grasp a situation where a machine is helping them whereas um, doctors that work with patients find it a lot more difficult and in fact if any one of you was involved in actually initiating the use of computers with doctors they would definitely have gone through this phase and I think for radiologists, this is not an issue. So this is one thing that is another additional uh, benefit for uh, radiologists and for this field. The other is uh, the fact that all of us has actually have long time ago decided how we are going to keep our images. And now that I'm working quite heavily with uh, eye images, I see how wonderful the decision to keep all images in a similar way, which was done many, many years ago in radiology and how important it is. And it's actually also um, tinting a little bit what we see in the area of uh, digital pathology, because the first thing we need to do worldwide is for all of us to keep our images in a similar way so that we can actually compare things and join things and do things together. And there is actually also uh, an effort in this area vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, medical information, which is called FIRE, which both all of us understand in the whole world that we need to have a language that can help us speak together and compare things. So I think um, all of these things actually make radiology a very good uh, place to start with artificial intelligence. Uh, there's also the issue of having quite a lot, despite what was sort of mentioned here, that there is a difficulty in getting uh, images information. I think basically it's actually the easiest thing is to get it from radiology because they're all in the same way. There is already, and there were already for several years, uh, images that were free to use in, in various topics, not in everything, but in quite a lot of topics. And you don't need to actually speak the language of the country that gives you the images. We in Israel have a lot of issues with the Hebrew when we try to use clinical information, but we have no issues at all with the images. The images are fine and you could look at them. So although if you want to use NLP, you do have issues with language, but the basic thing is that 
images are a united language, which helps a lot in what we need to do. And um, I was trying to uh, describe to you some of the experience that we have uh, in um, Asuta. Uh, as you mentioned, Asuta is a really huge uh, monster in terms of imaging. Uh, we do, nowadays we do already 800,000 images every year. We do about 30,000 images of CT and MRI every month and about a third of all the mammographies in Israel. So the, the numbers are huge and the data is uh, very big and very organized. It's all on one system and on one box and some people around the table have already worked with us so they know that. And uh, I think uh, what I wanted to point out specifically is the clinical perspective and the, by clinician I'm actually saying a little bit the radiologist. So um, as, as I think also my predecessor said, uh, there are a lot of uh, AI solutions that help you with one area along the line. So even let's say what you just mentioned about the chest uh, TB finding solution, I would feel very uncomfortable to use a TB solution because I would not be sure that it actually covers other options. And in fact, you might have somebody taking an X-ray because you want to rule out TB, but what he has is a growth. And maybe let's make it more difficult that the growth would be in one of his uh, vertebra rather than or, or otherwhere. So it is difficult when the solution actually solve one problem it is difficult for us as radiology to trust it to substitute us. And I don't know that there are many solutions that actually give you a general um, sense of being sure that you're covering everything. And in the areas that there is such a promise, maybe, I think we are going that way. And in fact, in my, in my uh, presentation, which I'm not showing you, I actually took uh, an example from a Dutch uh, trial that was using a uh, machine and radiologist as a double read for mammography, which is my clinical field, I'm a mammographer, and the results are wonderful. And instead of using um, two radiologists, which normally is the case in many countries, actually not in Israel, they use a, a, an AI and one radiologist, and it was fine. And I don't know, it would be interesting to think what would it be like if they used two AIs? I don't think anybody tried that. But I think we are going that way. We are going to a situation where we can use uh, the, the assistant in a way that we trust it, and we ignore what we can ignore by using it. And uh, I'll give you one example that uh, of how we changed an AI by working with it. I actually had two. The first one is um, we, as mentioned before, we use AI doc in Israel. Quite a lot of the hospitals do. And when when it was first installed in Israel in my uh, institute. The thought was that it's actually a little bit superfluous because we are mostly dealing with outpatient setting. So most of our patients are walking into our clinic and uh, the, uh, the premise of uh, IDOC is that it identifies urgent cases. So um, we said, let's try it. And we looked at previous studies, about 10,000 of those. And then we also installed it. And in the second day that we had it, we already found a case where uh, the patient needed urgent care, which probably would have not have received without the uh, sensitivity of the uh, AI. Now, obviously there, is, there are cases where the, the read is overshoot and it's not the case. We, we actually look at every case, but it does help us identify urgent cases in a scenario where you don't expect it, where you don't sit there and say, okay, this guy just went into the emergency room and we are looking for that thing. No, we were not looking for that thing. He came with headache, but the fact is that he does have a bleed. And uh, I think um, what we turned out doing there, which I think is, 
is a change for the company and for us was that instead of just taking the AI to be a, a prioritizing system for the radiologist, what we did was that we gave back the feedback from the AI to the radiographer in real time when the patient was just leaving the bed. So we could stop the patient from going home right now, right there, right then. And uh, we, I think this did a lot of things and two different things. Firstly, we actually gave a more pertinent treatment to the patient because then the radiographer had a quick, quick look. Sometimes he knew what was wrong and why it overread the study. And a lot of time he just called somebody and said, can you look at this study? So that was one uh, solution. But the other solution, which was even more important, and if I have the, the my slides, I will try to show you that one, is that we, we actually ask our radiographers routinely when they finish a study to uh, report on the study. This is part of what they do routinely. So they end a study, they need to run through it and just give a quick remark about the study. Obviously, they're not radiologists, they don't need to read it. What they need to say is, do they recognize something that is urgent in the study? That was already going on in my uh, hospitals, in my chain, for the maybe three, two years before we installed AIDU. And doing that and, and you know, forcing our staff to look at the exam after it's done, was uh, already giving us some reward in that sense. But the fact that there is now a machine that is also doing the same task and that is helping them and that is challenging them. So when they don't see something and the machine says, hey, there is something there, is really a very good way to do what we call uh, in America on the job training for the radiologists. Because we are trying to make the radiographers up to date and know what they need to do. And this is a very easy way of, of um, connecting, making it work for them. And I think uh, it's a good example why the companies need to work with clinicians closely and be amendable to them. And I should say also that I don't think always uh, what clinicians bring into the table is what the uh, the payers or whoever decides whether to buy or not to buy a, an, an AI is bringing to the table. But it does, we do have influence. We could actually be very good persuasive uh, material to whoever needs to take the decision. But we need to be persuaded. And uh, if you compare it to uh, research that is always done on, on drugs, there is something called phase four, which is when you already have a, a good drug and you want to insert it into the market and you want to have some kind of a real life experience with the drug. And we know already that phase four is partly checking the drug and partly uh, entering into the market. And I think this the same needs to happen with AI, we need to have the experience where the companies are working with us, letting us play with what they do, giving us a sense of uh,
the ability of 